Hello STEM enthusiasts, welcome to the third episode of Scientix TV. If you watched our first two episodes, and I hope you have, you know that this show is our way of thanking teachers for all their work, sharing industry contributions to STEM education, and highlighting the work of European Schoolnet's Ministries of Education. We want to update you on the latest developments in STEM education and make you laugh. Please let us know how you're doing with that by using the hashtag ScientixTV on your social media channels. Today's show looks a little different from our previous two. That's because this time of year looks different for teachers. Exams are over, classrooms are empty, and quiet summer days lie ahead. Today's show and the theme is one that may be on STEM teachers' minds already, and that's the summer learning loss. It's the theme of our latest Scientix newsletter. For a longer analysis, you can check out the June issue. Here on the show, we'll take a quick look at the topic and give you a chance to meet one of the teachers we interviewed for the print issue. We'll also hear from the STEM Alliance coordinator Ivana Kovac on how Amgen supports STEM education. And we'll still have a live experiment as always. But first, let me introduce you to my colleague and co-presenter today, Mattia Gentile. Are you excited to be on Scientix TV? Definitely. Hi, Agueda. And uh, hi, everyone. Mattia, what do we mean by summer learning loss? Well, yeah, so basically, summer learning loss, uh, also called uh, summer slide, uh, actually is what it sounds like. Uh, you know, kids come back to school in September and they don't remember what they studied uh, during the school year. Um, researchers have actually found that uh, they can lose up to two months worth of knowledge, especially in math. The problem has been uh, well documented in many parts of the world. One negative effect, of course, is that teachers need to repeat parts of the curriculum. And that can make, you know, like class boring for some students and well, especially for those who actually remember uh, what they would have learned uh, the, the year before. Today, we are joined by an educator who has experience in uh, entering summer learning loss, Nikos Amanatidis. Nikos used to be a primary school uh, principal, and now he's an educational consultant uh, going over 25 primary schools in northern Greece. Nikos, welcome you to the show, and uh, thank you for making time for us. Thank you very much for having me. Well, uh, could you give us an example of what knowledge children lose uh, uh, after the summer break? Yes, absolutely. Certain students, specifically in the early years of the primary school, find it quite difficult to read confidently and effortlessly, although in the previous year and during the last months of the previous year have mastered this skill. Additionally, several students find it hard to recognize and solve basic math problems, a skill that was achieved partially or fully in the previous year. Well, yeah, that, I imagine that's really difficult for, for teachers. Uh, but I imagine not uh, all kids experience this, right? I mean, um, there are children who uh, have different backgrounds and uh, who are more reactive to this. Yes, indeed, that is correct. And also a common observation in the classroom. From my experience and previous years of teaching, when I followed the same students on to the next grade, I had noticed that certain students lose a percentage of acquired skills from the previous year's studies. It seems that these students derive from specific backgrounds. Their parents are not so close and caring to their learning and school performance, as well as they do not have access to specific information such as the internet, books, libraries, or any other learning activities outside school. Um, and have you found actually uh, how teachers can help uh, prevent this learning loss? Yes, uh, preventing, this is a good question. Preventing summer learning loss can seem overwhelming sometimes for the teachers. But me as a teacher, I believe that you have the power to assist students move forward. Again, from my experience, I observed students overcome the knowledge and skills gap through group work, learning games, and book reading. Uh, in my school, 
uh, the first experimental, uh, we have founded a STEM summer school club where each student should read three to five books related to STEM subjects during the summer and to present a story, a few ideas or thoughts about the books when the next school year starts in September, specifically in, in Greece. That is through a science day we organize in the early days of the school year. We have also participated in a fun with STEM as a title, learning club, where students designed games as well as playing constructions for fun and learning purposes in STEM subjects, such as a kite, a windmill, a bridge to connect the desks in the class, a water tank, etc. These activities were presented later by all the kids in groups that participated in the class project. Also, we have organized a school STEM fair in September and June, the start and the end of each school year, where students present their activities and projects on different subjects, such as arts, math, robotics, etc. Wow, those are very nice initiatives. And uh, Nikos, do you think um, schools and uh, ministries of education are actually aware of this problem? And is there any support in uh, dealing with this? Yes, I believe they are. Uh, in Greece, uh, the uh, Ministry of Education, in connect collaboration with the Institute of Educational Policy, have initiated a new training program on differentiated instruction. Started in uh, it, it just starting in, in June, late June, uh, where you can effectively address through specific pedagogies, strategies, and techniques different learning personalities as well as learning pace and level of engagement of the children. Oh, perfect. And uh, do you think there are activities or resources that uh, you can re recommend for teachers or parents? You know, we're going over the summer, maybe uh, they can help uh, kindle this? Absolutely. Another great question. Open access books through online resources, children's libraries in deprived areas, audiobooks, learning games and school clubs, where you can be a part of a learning community that supports and encourages learning activities and caring. Also, and importantly, constant and quality parents training for the parents. The training sessions could provide a group and a local community collaboration by the school and the local authorities, as well as mutual assistance and support. Perfect. Thank you very, very much, uh, Nico. This was very helpful for Thank you. both Maracalo. teachers. Um, so, yeah, I hope that, uh, you know, going over the summer, uh, both parents and teachers will, will be able to think about it and, and ponder. Uh, and now I'll give the floor back to Aida. Thank you, Matia, and especially Nikos. We hope that some of your tips can inspire teachers to suggest STEM-related summer activities to parents. Of course, someday, far, far in the future, summer will be over and we'll go back to school. Let's hear from the STEM Alliance partner, Amgen. Ivana? Hello, Agueda. Summer can be a busy period for our industry members as we all need to get ready for September. And today, with us, we have Eduardo Settlin, president of Amgen Foundation. Eduardo, what does your summer look like? Do you get a break? I do. Uh, not a very long one. I am based in California, uh, but I get to spend the summer in Brazil where my family is, so my daughters get to uh, practice their Portuguese and spend a lot of quality time uh, with their families. Great, great. Uh, we hear that you have announced a major investment into something called Lab Exchange. Can you explain to our viewers what it is? Yes, very happy to. So the announcement is that we are making a $30 million commitment to Lab Exchange over the next three years. This is a continuation of a partnership we have started with Harvard University. Um, we went live in 2020 uh, with a goal of reaching 3 million users, and in two years we've reached 20 million already. Uh, with this grant, our goal is to reach 50 million users. Now, back to your core question, really, what is a lab exchange? And at the highest level, it's a high quality, curated, and free science education platform. It is tech for pedagogy, not tech for tech's sake, which sadly so, so many times is, is often in the education technology space. Um, I'll give you four highlights of what 
you can see in what you have access to in Lab Exchange. First, content from 140 different trusted partners, all within the same umbrella. Two, simulations. You can do virtual lab uh, experiments in uh, Lab Exchange. Three, something called an interactive sc scrollable, which essentially allows a learner to scroll through an experiment or a process and see all the different steps in their own pace. And last, career profiles. You get to see real life scientists of all sorts of different backgrounds. And so students can see themselves in a career in science. And last, uh, you know, when I say free, I don't mean it's free for the first uh, month. I don't mean free for the basic version. It's free uh, in its entirety on all the benefits for everyone who wants to use it. That sounds great. And uh, is this a resource that students can use on their own also during the summer break, maybe? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you're 13 years old and older, there's a lot for you in Lab Exchange. Um, I'll give you three highlights, three interactives that I find particularly cool. One is a human body interactive where you see the 11 uh, systems, the 11 organ systems of the human body, and you can overlay whichever ones you'd like to. So it's pretty cool to see what we are like underneath our skin. Uh, the second one is a gene editing uh, scrollable where you can really uh, see at, with, with the naked eye what's happening when people are uh, uh, using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to uh, 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 modified genes. And last, there's one called the evolution of trust, where you play a game. And this is based on, you know, in, in Christmas of 1914 on the Western Front, where British and German soldiers left their trenches, they crossed no man's land and gathered to bury their dead and exchange gifts and play games. Why do they trust each other? It's a fascinating game that really gets you to ask some tough questions and ponder upon the answers. Um, I'd suggest also students, there's a page called Feature Content. You can learn all about other sorts of content that might be of interest for students. That is great. And what about the teachers? The teachers who are watching us, can they also benefit from this platform? And can they get some ideas how to prepare for the new school year? Absolutely. Uh, first, I really hope that they'll have the time to take a break and relax. Uh, catch up their energies. They've been working really hard year after year and uh, over this pandemic, their lives have been so difficult. Um, our experience is that teachers are lifelong learners. They're always thinking about how can they make the student learning experience the best that it can be. Lab Exchange is built with this concept of how do we test and elevate hybrid or blended education for this? How do you just complement what they're already doing in the classroom with what the platform offers. Uh, I would suggest that they go uh, to a section called uh, content types and take a look at the teaching guides. These were developed for teachers and provides a lot of insights on how to use the content that we have created. And there's also another two content types that might be really interesting for teachers. One's called Pathways, the other one's called a Cluster. And these bring together video simulations and interactives in a prepackaged order for teachers to take to their classrooms. And what's really cool about this, Ivana, is let's say that they like uh, part of that cluster, but they don't like the other part. They can actually clone their pathway, delete the parts they don't like, add new parts that they might have for themselves, um, and they want to share with their students. And there they have it, a complete lesson for uh, uh, an experience in the, in the classroom. Um, That's a great help. Yeah, and it's really, uh, uh, the world is your oyster, and I really encourage them to spend as much time as they can, really getting to know the application and all the different things that they can do. That's a really, really great asset for all the teachers. Many thanks, thanks Eduardo, for being to, uh, today with us, and back to you, Agata. Thank you, Ivana. It's good to see how our industry partners support teachers and students, even during the long summer break. But now it's time for our most, our most explosive part of the show, the live experiment. Like last month, the experiment is taking place on the island of Lesbos in Greece. But it's better to be safe than sorry. What's coming our way, Matia? Matia? What? Sorry, what? What's coming our way? Oh yeah, true, the, uh, the experiment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, we're connecting now with uh, Georgia Rungos, a Scientix ambassador, TV regular, and uh, experiment enthusiast. 
As we mentioned last month, uh, George has a YouTube channel with more than 100 science experiments, and all of which can be performed with simple household items. That means that parents can do these experiments with their children over the summer. It's a fun way, you know, to engage with uh, STEM while uh, the school is out. George, welcome back to Scientix TV. George will now show us how to crush a can with air pressure. Take it away, George. Hello, Matia. Hello, everyone. Uh, today, we will explore the effects of atmospheric pressure. And uh, let me start with a short story. Almost 400 years ago, uh, in 1643, uh, during the Enlightenment period, a uh, very well-known scientist, assistant of Galileo Galilei, Evangelista Torricelli, succeeded in measuring the atmospheric pressure. His measurement showed that the atmospheric pressure in, uh, at sea level is 100,000 uh, newtons per square meter. This means that in every square meter of a table stands coin of air until the borders of atmosphere, which weighs as much as 10 cars. Of course, atmospheric pressure is uh, present all over the table and the table stands still. So, scientists proposed that if we could find a way to reduce the pressure from the one side of the surface, the other side will move uh, very quickly. To confirm that, all we need is uh, an aluminum can, a small camping stove, lighter uh, canister with water and ice, some water and some uh, paper towels. The steps are very easy, but uh, we advise uh, students to do this experiment uh, with adult uh, supervision. So, uh, we pour some water in the can. And we warm it on the camping stove. When the water starts uh, to boil, uh, we, quick, we quickly uh, put, uh, we put the can into the canister with the opening facing down. Just wait a minute. I think it's ready. As you can see, the can crashes and the water came inside. This happens uh, because when the water is boiling, the vapor, uh, the can is full of uh, water vapor. Uh, when the opening of the can is covered with uh, the ice, uh, the ice water, uh, the but the vapor water condenses to liquid and the pressure inside reduces instantly. The external atmospheric pressure crushes the can. So, if we reduce the pressure from the one side of an object, the object uh, will move. In this case, uh, the walls of the can. Uh, you see, science is fun. Experiments is uh, such a good way to reduce STEM concepts during the summer. Back to you, Matia. Wow, thank you, George. That was amazing. I guess I know we, want, we know what to do what, uh, with all the ice cubes that are going to be used for the summer. I might have to try a few of these myself over the summer. Thanks, Matia and George. We cannot wait to see what experiments await us next school year. But I'm afraid that's it for today. Now, don't forget to comment on social media using the hashtag ScientixTV. And thanks to our guests and everyone making possible Scientix TV, the show where you can look at the world through STEM glasses. Now tune in again in September, enjoy your summer break, all the best for your Scientix team, and goodbye. Bye.
Oh, I almost forgot. The Scientix Conference is back. Workshops, roundtables, presentations, and much more on Friday 18 and Saturday 19 November. Join us online to enjoy thought-provoking and inspiring sessions on the state of the STEM education in Europe. Registration is open in September. More information on the Scientix website.